Good morning. I uh, am grateful for the words Tom had. He talked about friendship and all of that. It ain't none of that true. Don't listen to him. Um, last time I was here... Well, first off, who was here last time I was here? Okay, so the rest of you that weren't here to hear me speak, uh, get ready to be disappointed. This should be good for you. Um, that's kind of our motto. Aim low. Um... No, I appreciate Tom very much. He just came in and sat down and and uh Tom, remember the first time I met you? Yeah. Is that memorable? Uh we were at a restaurant and somebody said, Hey, look, there's Tom Leach. And I said, You know what? I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go say hi to the man. So I got up in this restaurant and I walked over and uh he was talking with somebody and I said, Excuse me, I says, uh you're you're Pastor Tom Leach. Hi, I I'm i I'm Dave Gottschalk. I've I've wanted to meet you. And he said, yeah, that's great. I'll have a Diet Coke. And, um, see, I really wanted to be friends with Dave Hilbish, but he didn't have any time, so he referred me to Tom Leach. So, <laughs> see, we can have fun. Pastor's not here this morning. Um, I'll tell you a story. And uh, this way, you'll, you'll completely grasp the fact that I have no business up here. And you are probably way more qualified to be up here than I am. But I'll tell you a story. Now, we can't make this stuff up. This is true. It happened. It's real. And it's embarrassing. And by the end of the story, you'll say, yeah, you're right. You don't belong up there. Um, I had an opportunity a few years back to speak at a Methodist church. And so, uh, I'll speak just about anywhere, provided the fundamentals of the faith are there. So, uh, you know, we, we, I differ from the Methodists a little bit, not too much. You know, I was raised Baptist. We dunk them. We put them under. Uh, you know, the Methodists, they, uh, they put them out in the sprinklers. So we, we differ a little bit. But, uh, you know, hey, that's okay. You go to heaven dry cleaned if you want, like the thief on the cross. So, so, I, I, don't, so I, I took this invitation to go speak at this Methodist church in, in Indiana. And... Um, it was nice. It was a nice building. It was a nice sanctuary. Nice people. Pastor was a very nice man. He kind of showed me around the sanctuary before service started and they kind of had like a, like a raised pulpit just off center. And he says, that's where you'll, you'll give the, the word and this and that. I said, sure. And uh, beautiful building. Woodwork everywhere. Dark woodwork. You know, really nice and big casings and moldings everywhere. It was fantastic. And uh, he said, is there anything that you need? And I said, no, not really. I said, oh, you know what? Yeah, when, when I preach, my throat gets dry. So if you could have like uh, a water or something like that up there that I could drink because I'll, I'll dry out. He says, no problem. We'll take care of it. We prayed together. People came. The seats filled. We were at capacity. I got up there and I was laying it on them. Salvation by grace through faith. And I, oh boy, I let it rip, tater chip. And what happened was my throat got dry. So I'm really going at it. And I'm looking for this water. And I don't see it. And right over here is a water. A cup of water, right? So I grabbed it. And I'm still talking like I am to you people. And I look at it, it's a really ornate cup. I mean, we're talking like Indiana Jones, Holy Grail. Like, it matches this entire, you know, auditorium that I'm in. Hey, whatever. So I grab it as I'm preaching, and I take a big old drink from this cup, right? And I set it down, and everybody was in shock and awe. And like, in their seats, I... Like, did I fart? What happened? I don't know what happened. I've, I've, obviously, there is a communication breakdown because I don't know what's going on. And that pastor was a very gracious man. He came up to me and he's like, here, let me have that. You see, that's our baptistry. We're Methodists. And, and so then, as it turns out, I was, I was drinking from their baptistry. So embarrassed. But they let me continue and everything else. So, well, like I said, I was raised Baptist. Boy, we, we dunk them. And sometimes you hold them down until you don't see bubbles no more. And then bring them up. It depends. So that should speak to my qualification this morning. I have a message for you. 
I want it to be encouraging. At the same time, it's a simple message. Simple message. I enjoy listening to people go on and they give you Hebrew and they give you Greek and then all these different languages and making points and, you know, connecting dots and lines and this. I'm all for that. I enjoy that. I enjoy listening to it. I can't do it, but I enjoy listening to it. I have just a very simple message based on a few verses and I'll paraphrase a story for you from 2 Kings. It'll be up on the wall behind me. Before we do that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father God... Oh, might you control these next few moments. Might you work in the hearts of these people, in the hearts of this preacher. Lord, might I be up here this morning with the awareness of your power, with your presence. Lord, might you bring about and cultivate change in the hearts of many this morning. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. There's some verses that will be up behind me in 2 Kings chapter 3. There they are. Good job. This is going, this is working. This is what the Lord says, I will fill this valley with pools of water. For this is what the Lord says, you will see neither rain nor Wind, this valley will be filled with water. You and your cattle and the animals will drink out of it. Now let me give you a little backstory to this. You have three kings. And they are going to go march against Moab. And it should be a very, very easy, easy victory. You see the people of Moab, they raise uh, cattle, sheep, rams. They're not a fighting kind of people. They're a sheep raising kind of people. So this should be a very, very, very easy victory. So you have three kings that go to march against Joab. And they kind of take the out of the way route. Kind of go through the badlands a little bit to, to get to Moab. And they realize about halfway through their journey that they're faced with a logistical problem. And that is they're out of water. And so what should be a very, very, very easy, easy, simple victory and conquer of Moab, all of a sudden the tables are completely turned because they don't have any water. Their army has nothing to drink. Their horses have nothing to drink. Their animals are dehydrating. They're beginning to die. Things are looking, they are stopped dead in their tracks. They don't have any water. So these kings meet and they try to figure out, well, what should we do? And they come to the conclusion, they say, well, isn't there a man of God with us? A prophet. Elisha, I believe. Isn't he with us? Can't we go to him and can he talk to the Lord on our behalf and see if we can't remedy this water situation? It's funny because situations never change. It's just the names that change. So here you have these three powerful men who have everything handled on their own and then all of a sudden, roadblock, well let's rely on God. As opposed to just rely on God from the start, just like you and I do. Things get rough, then we go to God. So they go to Elisha, and, and bless his heart, he had a cool sense of humor. <laughs> You'd call him a smart aleck, I think. But these kings go to Elisha, and Elisha says, Well, hey, why don't you go ask the prophets of your fathers? Because their fathers worshipped false gods. So, well, why don't you go ask the prophets of your fathers for water? And, jo and Elijah had a good relationship with one of the kings, Jehoshaphat, and he heard him. And he said, why don't you bring me a musician? And while the musician plays, perhaps the Lord will speak to me and I can give you an answer. So they did. And the musician played and the word came to Elisha from God. And Elisha says, dig your valley full of ditches. Go back and dig your valley full of ditches. You're not going to see the rain. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to see the wind. You're not going to feel But God is sending the water. If I could give you one piece of advice this morning, or have you take one thing home with you this morning, this is probably what it is. In this upcoming year, dig your valley full of ditches. Dig the valley in your life full of ditches. Why? Because God is ready 
and willing and able to bless. God wants to pour out blessing onto you, your family, into your life. Dig your valley full of ditches. I wish we could stop there, pray and go home and leave it just kind of positive, but we can't. There's work involved. There's things that have to be done for God to send the blessing. God is ready to bless. Are you ready to receive? It's an amazing thought. God is so ready to bless you. Pour out blessing on your life. Are you in a position to receive? It takes preparation. It takes preparation. We have to prepare for God's blessing. The best example of that I could give you, since this is more of a uh, rural area, would be the farmer. Now, I don't know anything about farming. I submit that to you people. In fact, I could be way off base. It's happened before. I know nothing about farming. I'm from Detroit. So I know about like cars and hockey and losing football games. And so like <laughs> we've been rebuilding for 58 years, folks. Oh, the Green Bay fans are laughing at me. <laughs> Look at he waved at me. He's like, "Hi, Hail Mary Pass. How you doing?" <laughs> So I don't know anything about farming. I, I don't know anything. But I was in uh, Tennessee, and, and I was going to dinner with this, this gentleman. He was a missionary, and, and he is a farmer. And so I, I rode with him, and we, we began to make conversation, and I just was asking him about what he does. And, and he was telling me about his farm and his land and what he does and everything that goes in to his harvest. And he said, oh, it's all preparation. Everything I do up till that harvest is just preparation for the harvest. I said, really? And he began to tell me about it. And, and before anything goes into the ground, the ground has to be worked. And he said, it's, it's really something else. He says, we take samples of the soil and we, we balance things and we add things or we take away things. Or we, and, and he went on through all the way through lining up workers, through clearing space, through maintaining trucks, through calling the co-op, through on and on and on. All of this different stuff. And I said, so like, what's the balance on the scale of, of like work to harvest? And he's like, well, in my experience, it's 95% preparation and 5% harvest. Now, I don't know if that is true or, or not, but that's the figure that he gave me. The farmer's harvest is a result of his preparation. The blessings in your life is a result of your preparation. God wants to bless you. Are you able and ready to receive? Have you done the preparation that you need to do in order to receive? What must we do and how for God to pour out blessing in our lives? Well, it's very, very simple. The first thing, application that I want to give you is to dig ditches of priority. Dig ditches of priority in your life. I'm not trying at all this morning to get you to come up with a list of priorities. You have a list of priorities, just like I have a list of priorities. Whether you ever realize it or not, you already have that. I'm not trying to get you to come up with a list of priorities. You exercise your priorities every day. When the offering plate was passed, you exercise your priorities. When the doors of the church are open, you exercise your priorities. Whether you're here or not, you already have a list of priorities. Perhaps the better way to look at it is maybe I want you to evaluate, reevaluate your priorities. And see if there's something that's a little bit higher or something that's a little bit lower. Maybe something that's a little bit out of whack. It happens. And we need to find priority in our lives. And then once we have a good priority, then we can go and dig those ditches. There's a priority about it. You understand this morning you cannot be like our Lord unless you have priority. Right? Doesn't it say when you, when you come to the altar to bring your gift, 
If you, if you realize your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled with your brother first. Then come and give your gift. There's a priority about it, isn't there? Jesus had a priority in his preaching, didn't he? To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the outermost parts of the world. He had a priority about it. Now, I don't know why he did, but he did. So you can't really even be like our Lord unless you have priorities. And since you have priorities, we have to take a look and we have to make sure that our priorities are in the right order. Businessmen fail because their priorities get out of whack. Corporations go under because priorities are out of whack. You're frustrated with your politicians because their priorities to you are out of whack. Churches close down because priorities get out of whack. Start emphasizing the wrong thing. First class into second rate causes, right? Majoring on minors, that sort of thing. It happens all the time. I'm not necessarily talking about things, but I'm talking about the place things take in your life. We have to evaluate our priorities in order to dig the right ditches in our lives so God can bless. I've made a mistake. You ever made a mistake? It's happened to me with my priorities. My wife and I were youth directors at a church in, in Detroit for a number of years. And uh, it required about three nights a week that I or us would be gone. And so then what I ended up doing is I filled the other four nights of the week with, with more ministry stuff and speaking stuff and Bible stuff and, and studies and, and that sort of thing and ministry type things. And if you're a preacher, it's a pretty good thing. Like go every night and speak somewhere. It's, it's awesome. If, if you're married to one, it's not such a good thing because your husband's gone every night. So I thought for sure, well, this is the right thing to do and this is a good use of my time because it's, this is the God portion of my priorities, right? It's God and then it's my wife and my family and then it's my men. And so this is the God portion of my priorities. I'm totally right to do this and I did that for months and a disconnect began to develop inside my home. A separation between me and my family, my kids, my wife. There was a, a disconnect that came in. And, and I would love to tell you, we talked about it, but we, we kind of more or less kind of argued about it a few times. And, and I remember my wife telling me, she's like, that's, that's not your God portion of your priorities. That's your ministry portion, or your ministry portion of your priorities. And we would argue and I'd say, no, no, no. I I'm working for God. This is God's stuff. God's stuff comes first. God's stuff comes... And no, no, no. The God stuff is my personal walk with Christ. Is my personal Bible time with Christ. Is my prayer time with Christ. My personal growth with Christ. That's the God portion. And what happened was I was taking the ministry portion of my priorities and I put that up at the top. Disguised it as something else. And it worked for a little while but then a disconnect came. Priorities are out of line. And so it is in your life because it's like that in my life. So when the priority gets out of whack, you have a breakdown. You start to have failures. We have to evaluate our priorities regularly. Let me give you these two little thoughts to kind of help you, if you prior, as you're prioritizing. Seek first the rule of God over your life Seek second the righteousness of God in your life. Seek the rule of God over your life first. Seek the righteousness of God in your life second. Seek first the control of God over your life. Seek second the character of God within your life. And those are just two things to help you as you prioritize. It all starts with priority. An uh, old preacher once told me, properly placed priorities pave the way to the Father's plenty. Properly placed priorities pave the way to the Father's plenty. We need to dig ditches of priority in our life. Second application I give you this morning. We have to dig ditches of good structure. 
and we have to go big. Dig ditches of good structure and go big. You say, well, structure and priority are kind of the same things. Well, priority is identifying, putting that list together, and structure is go ahead and fit in the pieces and build in something that will stand on its own. That's what structure is. We need to dig ditches of good structure. Did you realize ditches even have structure? They do. They do. Water is heavy. Water finds its lowest point all the time, wherever it's at. Water can erode. Water can push over. Water can wash things away. So you have to dig ditches of good structure in your life. I worked for the railroad for a long time and we would dig drainage ditches alongside the tracks. And whether we were out there with a machine or, or with shovels, we would dig these ditches and we would, we would go down deep and we would widen it out and then we would almost reinforce the sides so that when the water came, it didn't just erode it and wash it away and, and, and mix it all together and you end up with kind of like a muddy mess. No, we would reinforce the sides. We had to add structure so that the ditch would hold the water. And so it is in our life. We have to dig ditches of good structure. You say, well, I'm not quite sure what that means. Well, it's very, very simple. Look at the things in your life that you want God to bless. In your heart. Look at the things in your life you need and you beg and you pray for God to bless. And then look at the structure of those things. You see, oftentimes as Christians, we kind of overthink our common sense when it comes to the things of God. Is it something God can bless? Is the structure of it good, right, and God is able to bless it? So if you're there and you're, you're a parent, you're, you're, you're like me, and you say, man, I want God to bless my family. Good. Now look at the structure of your family. Start there. Do we need to change the structure, improve the structure, fix the structure? I have read that a father only spends minutes a day in actual conversation with his children. Minutes a day. So then I wonder how many of those minutes a day in actual conversation are spent praying <laughs> with his children. Well, I want God to bless my family. Okay, let's look at the structure of the family. Is that you? Is that me? Are we doing what we ought to be doing? It's really simple, isn't it? I raise my kids. I want my kids to do great things. But I can't expect my kids to do any more or go any further <laughs> than what I'm willing to do and where I'm willing to go. <laughs> So I pray and pray and pray and pray, God, bless my family, bless my home, bless my... Is the structure of it blessable? Something to look at. Something to look at. I knew a lady, I still know her. That's a unique statement, Tom, isn't it? I used to know a lady. I still know the same lady, but I used to too. Um... <laughs> this lady sweet lady loved the Lord she wanted a kitchen that was her big thing she didn't have any kids she didn't, uh, the lifestyle was just different she wanted a kitchen she wanted one of them home and garden kind of kitchens one of them kitchens you see in the magazine where it's just big countertops and slate and all this stone and there's islands and there's uh, you know, hood vents and, and, big, oh, burr, and it's just, it, she wanted a kitchen. And she prayed for the kitchen. Forever. She just kept praying and praying and praying for God to give her this kitchen. Now it's a silly little story and a silly example, but you'll be able to draw it together if you stay with me. She was praying and praying and praying for this kitchen. She didn't have the money to purchase a new kitchen, pay for any of that. She didn't have the know-how to get a contractor or whatever to 
to do that work. She didn't know how to do it herself. So she had to rely on God. She's praying and praying and praying for this kitchen. Finally, one day I went over, <coughs> excuse me, to her house, <coughs> and I saw this kitchen, her current kitchen. And all of a sudden, everything just made sense to me. I walked into her house, she opened the door, and, and, and I was met with like the most famous saying ever when you go over to somebody's house unexpectedly. And they open the door and they say, Don't mind the mess. Hmm. I said, yeah, no problem. And I made a left and I went up the three steps and I went into the kitchen. And I saw this lady's current kitchen. Hmm. And I was amazed. I was amazed. There were dishes in the sink piled up past the windowsill. Days worth. The countertops were sticky and had crumbs on them and, and remnants of dinners past. Floors had cobweb and, and dirt and things gathered in the corners. I go to the kitchen table and it had become the catch-all for the entire house. Stacks of mail and papers and magazines from six years ago and everything else. The kitchen chairs became coat hangers as coats and gloves and scarves were draped over them. And I'm thinking, it's July. And, and <laughs> it was amazing. And it dawned on me, well, no wonder God hasn't blessed you with your new kitchen. If you can't be a good steward of the kitchen he's already given you. Silly little story, ain't it? Makes a lot of sense when we apply it to our lives in other areas. Structure. 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 How do you expect God to send immense blessing to you if you're not a good steward of what he's already given you? When I mention God blessing, 60% of the crowd thinks financial, which is fine. Thinks financial. I need God to bless us financially. I need God's blessing financially. Oh, we're struggling. Oh, we're hurting. Well, God can, will bless financially. But you've got to make sure your finances have good structure. If you spend more money than you bring in, it's hard for God to look down on that and say, here, let me pour out abundant blessing on that situation. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, I got one guy. All right. Hey. Spent a good morning. Um, <laughs> well, lie to me if you have to at this point. We're, we're just too far committed into this. But you overthink your common sense when it comes to God's blessing sometimes. We have to have ditches of priority and those ditches must have structure. Perhaps you got good structure. Perhaps you just dug your ditches in the wrong neighborhood. You dug ditches and they got structure but you dug them in the wrong valley. Well, why won't God bless me? Because he's over here. <laughs> It's funny when you think about it and you break it down and you find out how simple it is. You want to hear from God. Go where God is. Go where God is. I want God to bless me. Go where he is. I want God to bless my family. Take your family and put, put, put them over here where God is. <laughs> Dig your ditches there. And you'll be amazed at what will happen. You'll be amazed at the blessings that will come. Move where God is. We don't hear from God because we're not where God is. And we get mad about it, don't we? But when it comes right down to it, it's not a God problem, it's an us problem. <laughs> we're not where He is. Structure. Structure. Get things lined up, get a good structure, and go big. Go big. Those three kings could have come back after talking to Elisha and said, you know what? We ain't got that kind of time. We ain't got that kind of energy. Just kind of build a big trench right here. Enough to fill a bunch of canteens, water some of the horses. We'll be alright. We're only a day from Moab. 
Just get enough to last you a day, and then once we conquer them, we'll take some of theirs. But we'll make, we don't need to dig full of ditches. Yeah, you do. You need to go big. Every square inch you have, dig a ditch. You know why? Because that's how much blessing God is ready to send. Every spare space you have, dig a ditch. Because that's how much God is ready to bless. You're not going to see the rain. You're not going to feel the rain. But water is coming. Dig a ditch. Go big. Go big. I, I get so frustrated and so tired of good Christian people settling for piddly little blessings. I get so frustrated at that sometimes. Good Christian people Piddly little blessings. That's all they ask for. Go big. Go big. We serve a God that spoke stars into existence. He can handle anything in your life. And mine. He has. He has. Go big. Go big. Dig your valley full of ditches. Priority. Structure. Can I give you one more thought? And we'll be done. Invest. Invest in the digging. Invest in the digging. Dig deep. Invest in the digging. Don't, don't, just, just a couple shovels full. No, invest. Get into it. And go deep. Go deep. We need to invest with power and authority. Invest. So whatever area it is in your life that you want God to send blessing into, you want God to bless you in your relationships, invest. Invest. Invest in that relationship. If you don't know how to do it or you're not sure, look, look at the scripture. Look at what Jesus did. It's an amazing thing to see how Jesus never had to win an argument with anybody. He just had to make sure the person he was talking to knew that they were loved before he left. <laughs> Invest. Invest. Dig deep. Dig deep. Invest in the things of God. Invest in the things of God. You won't be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. For those of you who say, well, I, I want God's blessing financially. Invest in the things of God and you'll get it. Give. 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 And you'll get it. Like the fellow who wants to, well, I can't afford to tithe. <laughs> you can't afford not to tithe. Give. You'll get it all back and then some. It's how the Lord is. It's how the Lord is. It's basically how I live. <laughs> Give. Invest. Go deep. Deep. You have a nice ditch and it's so so wide and in, but it's shallow. No, go deep. Invest in it. Invest in it. Do the maintenance on it. Preventative. Come by and check it every so often. Make sure it's still holding. Fix anything that needs to be fixed. Invest in it. Dig deep. Dig deep. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Uh, my brother is a very good financial mind. My father is a very good financial mind. Uh, they invest. Uh, they're in the market. Uh, they have retirement plans and all sorts of things and they, they change things, you know, because that's a, that's a moderate kind of thing. There, and that, that one over there is aggressive. And we're going to change this and we're going to do this and then at this age we're going to roll something over into a CD and we're going to, and I don't, I don't know what they're talking about, but they know what they're talking about. So I sit there and smile and I nod like you people do with me. So it, it, it works. <laughs> and you, when you really think about it, God is the best investment plan there is. Invest. 
Invest. Give and you shall with zero enthusiasm whatsoever. All right. Give and you shall receive. That's not um, a maybe. That's not a maybe. That's, that's real. Give and you shall receive. Give and you shall receive. What you receive is a reflection of what you gave. What you receive is a reflection of your investment and your structure and your priority. So you say, man, I just, I don't know what's going on. I, I just, I give, invest. And the more you invest, the more you receive. We're here today because people all over the country invest and dig ditches. We're here today. We have the gas and the food and everything to be here today because people from Oklahoma all the way into Canada, they invest in the things of God. Invest. There's a verse in Malachi I really like. 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Get this. Try it. Put me to the test. I think you ought to. I think you ought to. We invest in a lot. Invest in the things of God. Give and you shall receive. Dig ditches of priority and structure. Simple. Simple. Don't overthink your common sense. You want God's blessing in your life? Be a good steward with what you have already. <laughs> And, and, and watch what God will do. Invest in the things of God and watch what God will do. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for these dear people who will show up right after a holiday and listen to a guy they probably isn't qualified to be up here but they listened and they were attentive and they made me feel special and I pray Lord that you bless them and I pray Lord that your words marinate in the hearts of everyone here myself included that we might go on this week reevaluating, perhaps structuring and better investing we thank you Lord for what you're going to bless us with in advance and might we just catch the wind here and, and, and become firm in our ditch digging because you're ready and some of us aren't ready to receive. Lord, I pray that you begin working in those hearts. Bless, Lord, the remainder of this morning together in this fellowship. And bless this church and its leadership. And I thank you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. I just wanted to say a, a word of appreciation. I actually wanted to uh, pick back on Dave a little bit because when we first did meet, actually, it was uh, after he had he had uh, found me on Facebook, and and the thing that he asked for was actually Dave Hilbish's number. So it's kind of <laughs> uh, Dave, actually Dave and Nate's number. <laughs> See, yeah, he's, he's no. I really appreciate their heart. I appreciate Ammunition Band, and they, they travel uh, from Michigan, and they, they come out, and and it's such an amazing thing. Most of all, I just want to say, if you get an opportunity just to to speak with them afterwards, just take that opportunity because, as they mentioned, the friendships that they've built over the years, it, it's, it's just such a, a blessing to see and hear the stories that that come from 
the ministry that they have. And again, they're such a blessing to us. And we really just appreciate their heart, appreciate their ministry. So take some time this afternoon uh, before you run off with other plans. I know there's, there's a lot of things to do on the uh, Christmas season. So we just ask, just take, take some time and just introduce yourself to the band members and, and just tell them how much you appreciate them. I appreciate Dave's heart and he's been a, a great friend for many years. So uh, really, uh, again, we're excited. We're going to be partnering with them. They'll be at the, the uh, overnighter this coming Friday. So come out and be a part of that. Uh, you'll get to experience them worshiping. And then if I'm not mistaken, they still plan on being a part of our Crave Retreat as well. So I really appreciate the, all that they are doing with us here at Stones Hill. So they've been quite a blessing. Uh, just want to continue to say Merry Christmas. We appreciate each and every one of you and just look forward to, to seeing you all next week. You guys are all dismissed. <laughs>